They're running out of dollars. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, global central bankers are panicking as they invoke crisis-era swap lines as they believe the world is running out of dollars. We're going to take a look and see if this will actually solve the liquidity crisis, and if not, why are central bankers even bothering to do this? We also have news that bondholders at a major international bank have been wiped out overnight. We're going to take a look at what happened there and why this will have major major repercussions for the entire banking industry. Plus, small and mid-sized banks are begging the government for more help. We're going to take a look at what they're asking for and why they know that the worst for the banking industry is yet to come. And we've got one of Wall Street's most storied analysts is saying the end of the bear market may be coming soon. We're going to take a look at what his call is and why we think the worst is yet to come. Let's go to Bloomberg where we picked today's story up with a headline. Fed and global central banks move to boost dollar funding as they're going to boost the frequency of their swap line operations, hoping in every bit of way that this will actually fix the problem. As central banks involved in the dollar swaps will increase the frequency of seven-day maturity operations from weekly to daily, and this across a coordinated statement with the Fed, Bank of Canada, Bank of New England, Bank of Japan, and ECB, and the Swiss National Bank. So what are these swap lines? What do they do? What's going on? On here so what this is intended to do is let's say that you have euros and you need dollars and you're having trouble getting your someone to take your euros and swap you for dollars and so there's a liquidity issue in the market because normally there shouldn't be a problem swapping one currency in to, for another in the marketplace so what the central bankers are believing is hey there's a liquidity issue or at least we perceive there's a liquidity issue so if you're having trouble you can bring your euros to say the fed we will then swap you for dollars, but it's a loan. You have to pay the loan back with dollars. And the idea is these are already available on a weekly basis. As the article said, these are open once every seven days. Now the issue is, well, maybe people have a problem with liquidity on Monday, even though we may be running our availability on another day this week. So perhaps if we just have it every day, this will actually alleviate the issue unless this isn't the issue at all. The U.S. Central Bank has typically provided access to such arrangements as times when there's a squeeze on the availability of dollars, and that can arise because banks outside the U.S. typically have obligations, or what are referred to as debts, that are denominated in greenbacks and in times of financial strain have less access to dollar funding. And so this is exactly true. The question we should be asking is, why are we invoking crisis-era swap lines if there isn't actually a problem here? Because we know from the Bank of Japan overnight, they said, hey, you know, we did what we said we were going to do and no one came. So no one needed money from us. So the question is, is this actually the problem or is this just some response by the central bankers to hope and make sure that maybe the system will just work its way out? Or is there some other issue we've got going on here? The liquidity injection is very much needed, especially for the Swiss and European central banks right now. We learned the hard way during the global financial crisis in 2008. Now, we can stop right here and say, we're not in a financial crisis right now, or at least we don't look around. It certainly doesn't look like a financial crisis. Perhaps you could weigh in the comments, do you think we're there now, or is one just around the corner, or will they get it right this time? When it took too long to set them up, the Fed was much faster in March of 2020 and this time around. And this move comes amid heightened tension that began with the collapse of three U.S. lenders about a week ago. So was the issue, see, let's try to figure this out. Was the issue with those three regional banks that failed that they said, hey, you know what? We've got a whole bunch of euros or yen or other currency, and gosh, we really need dollars and no one will swap it for us or we have a whole bunch of dollars and the problem is our depositors they want all these foreign currencies and we can't get it no it wasn't any of that wasn't that at all so it's telling us that this dollar swap lines all these swap lines are probably going to be rather ineffective here as the boost of swap lines will enhance the provision of liquidity or perhaps the impression of liquidity is really what they're trying to do describing the arrangements as an important liquidity backstop to ease strains in global funding markets and mitigate the impact on the supply loans to households and businesses. So I think we can safely say that the reason they're doing this is because they have nothing else to do. So they're not sure what the problem is because this doesn't appear to be fixing anything. So what they're doing is saying, look, we're just going to do everything.
everything. And then when it gets worked out, presuming it does, then of course you'll know the central bankers will raise their hands and say, hey, look, see, we fixed it. Good thing we're here. But in reality, as I've said before, there will be policy responses and they will largely be ineffective because whatever's going on here is not what the central bankers think it is. But now let's turn to the banking system back again to our story on Credit Suisse where we see bondholders now getting wiped out. And that's not the story. The story is why this is going to be a problem for the other banks. As Credit Suisse bond wipeout threatens 250 billion market, if you hadn't heard over the weekend, UBS has now entered an agreement to buy out the troubled bank. And this is what actually is now the fallout. AT1 bonds, also known as contingent convertible bonds or cocos inside the industry, were introduced after the financial crisis. So you know, of course, it must be great as a way to transfer banking risk away from taxpayers and onto bondholders. They also became a popular investment product that money managers and banks, including Credit Suisse, marketed clients to get this as a relatively safe way to boost yield on your bond portfolios. And European banks love to issue these AT1s, even though the interest costs are higher than traditional bonds because their bail-in features reassure regulators that the banks hold enough capital buffer. And that makes AT1s a less financially painful way of building up capital than issuing common stock or equity shares. So I want you to understand is the first thing is banks are using this in a, a, an alternate way instead of issuing shares to raise capital. So it seems like a pretty good idea. Well, until we find out this is what just happened to all the Credit Suisse AT1 bondholders. Under the terms of the deal between the two Swiss banks, the AT1 holders get nothing, while equity holders get UBS shares that are not probably worth a whole lot comparatively The value Credit Suisse's existing shares at around 0.7 Swiss francs. That is far below where they traded Friday, but still something. So what we're facing here is the real issue is, is there's a ton of these out there, which we'll look at in a moment, but I want you to think about this. If a bank needs capital right now and they cannot go out to the equity market because no one wants to buy their shares. So they say, hey, you know what? I'll issue some of these AT1s. But now guess what? The market's starting to find out that, hey, maybe those things that I thought were relatively low risk mean I could lose everything. And this is going to put bank funding into a bigger issue of stress. There are about 254 billion AT1 bonds outstanding. Imagine if those went bust and the securities are often banks most actively traded bonds because of their large size. They also pay a higher interest rate than traditional debt because they converted, can be converted to stock or written down, in this case, all the way to zero if trouble in an institution emerges. So that is actually a problem because now, again, as I said, all this is going to do is put the question now if they're going to get wiped out. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't. I if they do not interpret it as me saying that, you know that, they should get wiped out so the other banks have some leeway to raise capital. I totally agree. Maybe you disagree with me. You can weigh in the comments. I have no problem with them being wiped out. I just want you to understand there's going to be repercussions here to the broad industry is if people think they can lose everything and the banks raise their hands and say, hey, we need some money, buy some of these bonds. People might say, you know, what? I don't think so. And now let's turn to First Republic because there's more problems here in the small and mid-sized banks that are telling us that all these things the central banks are doing, the government's doing, aren't working as First Republic stock continues tanking. But other regional banks, at least for the moment, were rallying on early Monday. First Republic continued to crash at the time of recording. As the S&P reduced its credit rating for First Republic to B-plus from double B-plus on Sunday after first lowering it to junk status just last week. And of course, that was enough to get everybody to flee. But let's dig deeper here because what we're trying to see here at First Republic is a big hole that's trying to be filled. And perhaps there just isn't enough money to fill it. Or there's fear that this hole is going to get a whole lot bigger and no one has the power to stop it. On Thursday, a group of major banks, as we talked about last week, agreed to deposit $30 billion in First Republic to shore up confidence, which obviously so far hasn't worked, even though it suspended its dividend, says it has $34 billion in cash. The deposit infusion from 11 U.S. banks, the company's disclosure that borrowings from the Fed, get this, range from 20 to $109 billion, and borrowing from the Federal Home Loan Bank increased by $10 billion, and the suspension of its dividend collectively led us to the view that the bank was likely under high liquidity stress, as S&P noted. What a shocking concept here. But believe me, the reason their stock price is still crashing is because people believe that this liquidity injection, these loans, are not enough to fix the problem. And that's why we head over to this story 
to see why the small and mid-sized banks are begging the government for help. There's a good reason why, because they know this is going to get a whole lot worse. As mid-sized U.S. banks ask FDIC to insure deposits for two years, wait a second, what's going on here now? Notwithstanding the overall health and safety of the banking industry, confidence has been eroded in all but the largest banks, which is true. Confidence in our banking system as a whole must be immediately restored, adding that the deposit flight would accelerate should another bank fail, which is literally stating the obvious here. If we continue to see banks fail, and if you don't think, if you're not looking at where your money's at, I can promise you a lot of other people are thinking about how much money they have at these various banks and are reevaluating whether they should keep it there or move it out because there is real fear here. And if we do see another bank fail, well, they're right. Money is going to flow out in a huge way as they cited remarks by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen that only that the backstops put in place so far will protect uninsured deposits only. Get this only if regulators find it necessary to protect the financial system. System, and that's a category unlikely to include the smaller banks. And that's what has them afraid right now is that they could run into problems as deposit flight continues. The government says, hey, you know what? We're only going to cover up to the FDIC limit. Unlike the other banks, which we thought were more important, we don't think you are. And as long as consumers and depositors think their money isn't safe, they will move it. And that will only make the problem worse. But one person who thinks that this may be getting close to the end. That's Mike Wilson, and he says that we could be near the end of the bear market. As Morgan Stanley strategist says, bank stress signals, bear market end, I think I'm going to have to disagree with him, even though he's one of the most accurate analysts on the market today. With backstopping a bank deposits by the Fed and FDIC, many equity investors are acting if this is an, asking if this is another form of QE, it's not, who correctly predicted the sell-off in stocks last year and rebound in October. We argue it's not, instead represents the beginning of the end of the bear market as falling credit availability squeezes growth out of the economy. Now, remember, a lot of people believe that the stock market reacts to QT in a, QE in a positive way, QT, which is what we're doing right now in a negative way. So they're trying to reassess and say, hey, is the Fed doing QE here? Because there's this mythical belief that somehow QE causes stock prices to rise when it really has absolutely no relationship. Wilson is not alone in forecasting a tough time ahead for the markets. He said the euro curve will be proven right, signaling recession ahead. We're going to challenge that here in a moment. The first quarter will likely be the high point for stocks this year, and that equities won't reach lows until the Fed has pivoted to cut rates. That, well, I obviously disagree with. Here we can see the 10-year, two-year yield curve in red against the Wilshire 5000 price index in blue. The, the green line is the baseline of where the yield curve is inverted. And what's important to note is when the red line is crossing positive up through the green line and rising. You can see that happening one, two, three, almost four here, very close, and not yet five. Notice what happens to the blue line as the yield curve steepens, the stock market in blue sells off. So the idea that when we look up here in the corner and say, hey, maybe the bear market is over, maybe, I don't know if you agree with this, maybe the bear market has really hasn't begun yet. So I'll let you weigh on that in the comments. Let's look about the federal fund rate here because the notion that the Fed cuts rate and everything's okay, here you can see again the Fed funds rate now shown in red against the Wilshire 5000. As the funds rate declines, you can see that each time here, what happens to the blue line the stock market, you've got it. It heads lower. The market doesn't bottom until it believes the Fed actually has control over what's going on or the market has actually kind of settled into the recession being near the bottom. We're nowhere close to that yet. But Mike Wilson saying we could be there. Well, I don't know about you. I'm going to say I disagree. I think this whole problem is going to get much worse. What the real issue underneath the system is, I don't know. What I do know is the central bankers are powerless to stop it. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.